Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course on directory structures and files. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about the concepts from our 220-601 and 220-602 exams, both very similar, where we need to identify concepts and procedures for creating, viewing, managing disks, directories and files and operating systems. And we're going to focus on the directory structures and the files aspect of this particular requirement. We're going to go through what a directory structure is on your system, understand how to navigate the directory structures. We'll create some folders. We'll create some files. We'll talk about file att attributes. And then finally, we'll go through what permissions you might need for these files and things to keep in mind when setting permissions for these files. Let's start with directory structures. Directories are really the key to where we, we organize things on our hard drive. We organize these into directories. And occasionally, you'll see these referred to as folders. And they're represented as folders in your Windows front end that we're about to look at. And so we put these in directories. Otherwise, we'd have just one big hard drive that's just full of thousands and thousands and thousands of files. There would be no way to organize things. This is very similar to your office. You put things in separate folders in your office so that you can keep them organized. You don't keep everything in one big folder. The directories can also be nested. So this is a little bit different than what you might do in your office, although if you've seen some of my folders, they look like this. You have a folder, and you put a folder inside of a folder, and then you put another folder inside of that folder. Although it's not very practical in the real world, on the computer it becomes very practical because I can create a folder for 2008. Underneath there, I can create a folder for January. Underneath there, I can add di different documents or different images. Then I can create a step right up and have a 2008 folder, one for February, a 2008 folder, and underneath that have one for March. So you can nest these things in different ways. And the idea is that you can have folders within a folder, within a folder, within a folder, within a folder. You can really go quite a bit in these operating systems so that you can organize things in ways that make sense. Now, there are some folders on your system that are best that you don't touch. Uh, these are system folders. They are folders that have been set up for your applications to run. And the, these are really places where things are stored so that your system can operate. They're not stored there so that you can change the files, delete them, or modify what happens to be in those directories. The idea is that you write them there, and it's best just not to touch anything. So as we go through this directory structure overview and you start looking at your system, if you ever see a folder and you don't recognize what's in there, you're best leaving it alone and going back to your directory directories or your, your documents folder and working inside of there to be able to do some of these exercises. Let's talk about the syntax you might need to move through these directories. This is very easy to do in Windows when you point and click visually. But I want to tell you what you might also be expected to see at the command line. Now, the first thing is that these volumes on our system have a drive letter associated with them. Now, in the most simplest fact, the, a single hard drive with a single partition is going to have a single drive letter associated with it. That's how most people's machines at home are configured. That's usually how your system at work is configured. But you may have drives and shared folders that are out on other servers. And so you have to have some way to designate how you access that particular folder. And you use these drive letters. It's a drive letter followed by a colon. So you see C colon is your usually your hard drive that's local on your machine. A D colon might be the CD-ROM that's in your device. H colon might be a shared folder that's out on another file server. Now, the challenging part about this is not everybody's hard drive is drive C. Not everybody's CD-ROM is drive D. Not everybody's shared folder, even if it's the same shared folder, happens to be H. So that takes a little bit more management to get your arms around exactly how a person's machine might be configured. But don't just assume that everybody is using the same one. Generally, we try to keep them the same. But drive C is the hard drive. That's kind of the place where everything stops. So almost everybody has a drive C for their hard drive. But everything else is usually up for grabs. You should also know your slashes. Now, there's the difference here. There is a backslash, and there is a forward slash. The backslash is the slash usually on the keyboard that is just above the inner key. That's where it is on mine. So the backslash is a little bit different than the forward slash that is also where your question mark is. Now, this is uh, sometimes one of the most challenging things you'll try to figure out when talking to somebody who's not familiar with these directory structures. 
which one the backslash is. And if you perform a command and you're getting some type of syntactical error, it's probably because you used the wrong slash. Whenever we talk about directories and using folders and finding information on your hard drive, it's always the backslash. Microsoft and Windows always uses the backslash. The forward slash is not used for anything relating to directory structures in Windows, at least not by default. So we're always going to be talking about the backslash as we go through these uh, set of processes and procedures in this module. Let me give an example of some of the things you can expect to see on your system relating to those C colons and the backslashes. What I'm going to do is right mouse click on my computer and choose Explore. And this brings us up to our Windows Explorer. Now you can see already I have a number of drives in my system. And here's those letters with the colon next to them. My floppy drive is an A colon. My local disk is a C colon. My DVD drive is D colon. And a new volume that I just created in my previous module that on RAID, I created a striped volume called E. So I have an E colon. Now, we are already seeing that's a very easy way to figure out what's on this machine. If I was connected out to some shares, I would also see my network shares listed in this view as well. So all you have to do is go to My Computer, explore that My Computer section, and you'll see them all listed out there. Very easy to tell. Now, if I click on Drive C, you can see there are a number of folders in my Drive C. There's a Documents and Settings folder, there's a Program Files folder, and a Windows folder. There's not much in my Drive C. This is a basic Windows installation that I've done. But notice up here on this address bar at the top, it tells me that currently I'm in this root of C, which means I'm in C colon backslash. There's that backslash. So we're starting to combine these things together, C colon backslash. If I was to move into the Documents and Settings folder, I'll double click, you can see I'm now in C colon backslash documents and settings. And remember we talked about embedding a folder within a folder within a folder. This is a very good example of this. I'm going to use these plus signs here to give you a feel for what this looks like. And I'm going to expand out. There is a documents and settings folder. Underneath documents and settings is a professor messer folder. I'll double click on that. Underneath the professor messer folder, a bunch of other folders. I'm going to click on My Documents. And underneath there is, for instance, a My Music folder. And you can see how these different folders are embedded and they're separated out with that backslash. So C colon backslash Documents and Settings, backslash Professor Messer, backslash My Documents, backslash My Music. So this is the syntax that we use on every Windows operating system, on every DOS operating system. It's been around forever. And now you understand exactly the way that these folders are embedded and are put within each other. If I wanted to back up to Professor Messer and move into application data, into Microsoft, you can see I still have the first set, the documents and settings, backslash Professor Messer, backslash application data backslash Microsoft. Again, that embedding and that, that process of moving down the tree is just designated with that C colon and then the backslashes uh, specifying all of those different folder names as we go through this. Let's say we wanted to create our own folders and we wanted to organize some things on our hard drive. Windows makes this very easy. From that same file manager, we can right mouse click or create uh, the file pull down menu and create a new folder. So we'll do that, but you can also do this from the command line with a command called make dir, make directory, M-K-D-I-R. So let's, let's look at how we would use both of those and make a directory with both of them. Well, here I am in my documents folder. I'm in the C colon backslash documents and settings backslash Professor Messer. And perhaps we'll go into my documents because I know that's where I want to store all of my documents. Now, one of the things about Windows you'll notice, you can also click on my documents. It takes you to the same place. It's just a shortcut that gets you down to documents and settings, Professor Messer, my documents, exactly the same place. So when I click on my documents, it puts in my documents in the address bar. When I click down here on the drive C, where the drive actually is, where that directory actually exists, it puts this space. Now, if I would like to create a new folder, I right mouse click and choose new, and I can do a new folder. And it creates it with a name called new folder. But maybe this is where I would like to put my videos. And I just type in the name and hit enter, and now I have a new folder. It's that simple. Now, from the command line, there's a little bit more involved. So let's have a look at how we do that from the command line. If I click on the start, button down here at the bottom, my menu pops up, and then I click Run. And I'm going to type CMD and hit Enter. And what pops up is a command prompt. 
This command prompt allows us to have access to what we have on our hard drive. Now, notice I have documents, C colon backslash documents and settings backslash Professor Messer. Well, that looks familiar to me. There are some number of commands. We'll talk about these in a moment that will list out what we're looking to do. So documents and settings, Professor Messer, there's a command you need to know called dir directory. And this gives you this odd looking view of the screen that shows different directories, desktop, favorites, my documents, and start menu. Well, that looks interesting. If we flip back to documents and settings and Professor Messer, I have that desktop, favorites, my documents, start menu. All these other, other folders that are here that are lighter color are hidden, which is why we don't see them down here in our command prompt. Now, let's say we're ready to create a folder inside of this. So I'd like a place now to store some of the information I have from 2009, the new year is upon us. So I'm going to use that command we talked about before, make directory, and I'll call this directory 2009. If I hit enter, it doesn't say anything on my screen. Well, that's sort of the way that these command prompts work. They're just assuming you know what you're doing at this point, and if you don't hear anything bad, it must have worked OK. If I use that directory command again, you'll see there is indeed a directory here called 2009. And just as we might expect, if I go back to my Windows front end, there is a new folder down here at the bottom, 2009. It's the same thing as if I was here and typed a new folder. And so it's exactly the same process, just doing it at the command line involves a little bit more typing than doing it from this nice Windows front end. And in that last example, we used a very simple file name, 2009, my videos. The idea is that we want to make these as descriptive as possible, though, while at the same time being very manageable and reasonable. Windows and its operating system, its file formats, allow us to have two types, two pieces to the file name. The first part uh, of all of these all together, these two parts of the file name can be a total of 255 characters long. You can really name out a file with a lot of description in 255 characters. So these long file names become very useful for us because we can name a file. This is a long file that has a document in it. It doesn't, doesn't have a very descriptive name associated with it, but you get the idea. You can make them nice and long. Now, there's also an extension associated with these. Usually, there is a period, and there's a set of characters on the end that help identify what type of file it is. For instance, this is an almost impractically long file name dot HTML. That's how we specify that, that period that's stuck in the middle there is as a dot. This first part is the file name, and this part on the end is what we call the extension. Now, in the legacy operating systems of the DOS days, we called this the 8.3 format because you couldn't have 255 characters. You could have eight characters in the front and three characters in the back. You could have eight character file names, three character extensions, and that was it. Those are short file names. So instead of having this as an almost impractically long file name.html, you could have file name.txt. That's a text file. Or you could have prof.m. That's it. Uh, you got into these very odd naming and numbering conventions with files back in those days just so you could keep eight characters as the file name and three characters as the extension. Given what we're doing these days, it seems very difficult to, to even think that we were using things that way. But indeed, that's exactly the way we were going about taking advantage of them. Now, the file names themselves are pretty important. And there are certain pieces of these files, certain things you can't have in the file names themselves. For instance, you cannot have a period as part of the file name. The period is used to designate the difference between the file name and the extension. You can't have quote characters. You can't have a forward slash or a backward slash, you cannot have brackets, a colon, a semicolon, an equal sign, or a comma. That means that you can have professor's file dot text with the apostrophe in it because an apostrophe is fine. But you could not have a document that has not a good document where the A is in brackets or document is in quotation marks. Those cannot be done. So keep this in mind in the exam. You may be asked which of these file names is an incorrect file name. Just look for any of them that might have any of these characters in it. If you see them, they're an incorrect file name right off the bat. The idea is that you would also have something that's very descriptive as part of your extension. Most extensions are very standardized. So text files may always have a TXT in them. Movie files might always be called MOV. 
And you'll see these extensions, these very common extensions will always come up this way. Now, that extension, extremely important. So keep that in mind as you're working with file names. Don't just give it any extension name. There may be something even the application you're working on puts by default as part of the extension. So keep that in mind as you're, you're naming these. If you call something stargate.txt file, that's a text. That's the plain old text information. Continuum, Continuum.mov means that this is an Apple movie format. So you'll become more familiar with those as you work more with extensions. Just keep in mind that those are pretty important. If you change that extension, you may be changing the way that Windows uses those files. You may not want to do that. Also, as you're working with files, you're going to be noticing that certain files have certain attributes associated with them. One that you'll notice is that certain files will try to change the file. And it says, well, that file's read only. You can't write anything over that file. You can't change the contents of what's inside of that file. You may also see that there are file attributes called archive. When you do a backup of your system, Every file that's backed up, usually your backup program marks that file, puts a little chalk mark on it and says, I've backed you up, just so you know. If that file ever changes, the archive bit gets set. But the idea is that next time the backup program comes along, it can decide what to back up based on what has changed. So since this archive bit is there, it notices that it's a modified file since the last backup. So if the archive bit is set, that means that, yep, you've, you've changed something there. I'm going to back you up next time. We're going to archive you next time. Now, the system files are also have a special attribute on them. You'll notice they have an S or a system configuration, especially for files that are used during the boot process. You'll see this attribute used for those. There's also, and we've already seen an example of some of these, certain attributes that are hidden. You can hide the file from being obvious when you start doing directory uh, views of the directory. Now, this doesn't hide the file from anybody. It's very easy to find those files or see those files. Specify, show me the hidden files. It'll show you where they're hidden. But if you'd like to just hide them and keep them out of the way while you're trying to do normal work on your system, it's a good way to get things out of your site so that you can work on something that may be more important in that same directory. If the file format of your hard drive happens to be NTFS, there are a number of extended file attributes there as well. So if you have time to go into your NTFS partition onto your file system and look at some of those files, you'll see things that go a little bit beyond read-only archive system and hidden. And that's what that's about, is NTFS provides us with much more capability than some of the things that you'd see in legacy operating system or file formats. Let's look at some of these attributes and where you might see some of these. This is on my documents and settings backslash all users backslash documents backslash my music backslash sample music. And if you have Windows XP, you probably still have this directory on your machine. There are two files in here. One is Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9, and the other one's something called New Stories Highway Blues. Now I'm going to right mouse click on Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9, and I'm going to choose Properties. Inside the properties, we have a section here called attributes. So there's two that we were just talking about. There's a read-only attribute and a hidden attribute. Now, if I choose the hidden attribute and click OK, you'll see that the Beethoven Symphony, I've told my Windows Explorer, show me the hidden files, but make them kind of grayed out. And it specifies, you can see that it's a little bit grayer than the file that is not hidden. Now, there were some other attributes in here as well. If we click the Advanced button, you can see there is archiving bits that we had set. So the file is ready for archiving. It also allows fast searching or allows our indexing service to index the file. There's also attributes for compressing the file. If we'd like to compress this to save space, or we would like to encrypt the contents of this so that the data is encrypted, nobody else can see it. These are some of those new additional attributes available in NTFS that you don't have have in FAT32. So if you're running a FAT32 volume, you won't see any of those options available. You don't have any of those advanced capabilities. You're only going to see those on an NTFS partition. Another functionality of managing files is something called permissions. You can allow people to access your files, or you can restrict people from having access to your files. You can do this on the same computer. So you might be able to log in and see your files. But somebody else could log into the same machine and not see any of your files. Or maybe you can specify which ones they can see. This is also useful over the network. In a large environment where many people have access to the network, you might want to allow certain files, certain spreadsheets, certain word processing documents to be available for anybody else in the organization to see. And you do that by setting permissions. 
both folders and files can have permissions. And generally, when you set the permissions on a folder, it also, every single file and folder underneath that take the same permissions. It's not always the case. You can change some of those attributes in the way that it works. But you can set up these types of permissions. On files, you can set, up, set it up so people might have full control, same control as you. Or maybe just modify it. Maybe read and execute, or read it, or write it, or any combination of those things. Maybe you'd like for everybody to be able to read it, or read and execute. Maybe it's a program, but not be able to write or modify it. So you can change different sections of that. If it's a folder, it's similar type permissions. There's a little bit of a change. For instance, full control, modify, read, and execute. List folder contents is something that's there, read and write. So you might want to allow people to see what's in a folder, or maybe it's something where somebody's just putting it into a Dropbox, and you don't want anybody else to see what's in there. So many people can drop many different files in there, and nobody else knows what happens to be in there because they can't list the contents of that folder. Let's look at what type of permissions are on my system. Now in this scenario, I would like to show people or give access to people to be able to put things into the My Pictures directory. Now if I right mouse click on My Pictures and choose Sharing and Security, you'll notice it doesn't come up with any of those permission things we were talking about. We can make the folder private. We can share the folder on the network. Really, we have the option to allow users to change my files. This is what's called simple sharing configuration. But we are trying to learn more about the operating system. We need to know more about permissions. In fact, we may want to set up something very specific for the My, my Pictures directory. I might want to allow people to have different types of permissions there. The only way you're going to be able to see that is if you go to the Tools pull down menu, choose Folder Options. In the View folder, scroll all the way to the bottom of your Advanced Settings and disable the Use Simple File Sharing option in Windows XP and click OK. Now nothing changes on the screen except now when I go back into Sharing and Security after right mouse clicking that folder, you'll notice that the Sharing tab is a little bit different. I can now choose to share this folder, but now I have access to set the permissions of people who access this folder over the network. And if I click that, I can start to see some of those permissions I was talking about. Full control, change, and read. And I can add and allow and deny different settings for those. I can also change under the Security tab who can access this if they happen to be on this computer or have authentication onto this computer where I now have everything I was mentioning before, full control, modify, read and execute, list the folder contents, read, write, and then there's special permissions that are there which we can set up under the Advanced tab. So you can see you can go very, very specific about certain permissions and rights and controls that Windows allows you to drill down and, and drill down and make specific changes to. If you're managing a file server, if you're managing a large server that a number of people are using, you're going to want to become very familiar with the permission settings that are in Windows, which goes well beyond the scope of the CompTIA A plus certification exam. It's important that you know how to change those and you happen to know what those permissions are about and what how Windows uses them. You don't have to go into any intricate configuration settings though for your exam pieces. That's a little bit farther than what the CompTIA A plus exam is, but maybe that's something you'll think about when you're ready to take your Microsoft certification. In review, we've looked at a lot of different pieces with files and directories. We've talked about the structure of the directories, how to navigate through some of those pieces. We even created some folders and looked at creating how files are, are there. We looked at file attributes with our read-only and hidden in system. And finally, we looked at how file permissions are used both on our local machine and across the network. If you'd like to watch any of our other videos, participate in our message boards, see what's in our wiki, and much more, visit our website, freeaplus.com.